Good morning, everyone. For those of you who couldn't hear any audio until now, uh, the reason is because we hadn't started the teleconference or the web the webinar, um, but we are about to get going. We've still got a lot of people flowing in, so we'll keep letting people in as we go. Um, for those of you who are new to the session, uh, welcome, and I'm sure lots of other people will be coming in soon, um, but please... Can you uh, just note the following observations because of all the challenges around Zoom? Uh, we've introduced the waiting room, which is why we're still letting people in as we go. Um, in addition to that, though, can you please, uh, we request that you turn your video facilities off. Um, that enables me to monitor whether anyone with uh, bad motives comes into the room by mistake, uh, in which case I can get rid of them very quickly. Um, as you can all see, the chat room is open at the moment, uh, and we do encourage you to introduce yourselves and to chat. Um, we found the chat facility, I think particularly in the last session, very, very helpful um, because uh, participants were able to interact with each other and answer questions. So you will have seen that we actually shared the chat um, log with you in the resources afterwards, and we'll Hopefully do the same again if we get um, good conversation. Yeah, but it, obviously because of the risk of being Zoom bombed, I will be monitoring the chat very closely. And if there are any problems, I will turn the chat facility off and let you know that I've done that. But uh, the last two webinars have all been fine. So I'm hoping that we'll have another clear run because our securities are much better on the webinar in the last two rounds. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Nadumo Dlamini from the Association of African Universities, who will introduce herself, welcome you all, um, and we'll be on our way. Uh, for those of you whose sound is breaking up, as far as I can tell, generally the sound is okay. So I suspect that might unfortunately just be a problem with the connectivity on your side, but I will keep monitoring from here. So welcome Nadumo. Thank you very much, Neil. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, those that are already in their afternoon. We welcome you again to the last webinar where we will be talking about how you can effectively communicate as you teach your students. Uh, my name is Nodumo. I work for the Association of African Universities and I'm representing my boss, Professor Etienne Ehile. Uh, and I'm here to just uh, thank you for taking time to participate in these webinars, especially those that have participated in all the four webinars. We are eager to hear your feedback as we plan other capacity building initiatives. So please enjoy this webinar and uh, we look forward to hearing from you in terms of how we can uh, improve the future webinars and in what areas you require additional capacity building. Thank you very much. I would now like to hand over to my colleague, Andrew, who is uh, our facilitator today. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone. Um, today's team, um, uh, we've already had an introduction from Nodumo. Uh, thank you very much. This is um, obviously AAU's uh, initiative and we're very happy um, as part of OER Africa to co-host here today. Um, in the back room, making things happen, we've got uh, Neil again. Uh, for those of you who have already interacted with him, you know, he's a very efficient gatekeeper, trying to keep things flowing very mm -hmm. nicely. Uh, mm -hmm. We've also got Kathy again. She's back and is making things happen uh, behind the scenes. And Tony is helping us out as well today. There's Tony up in the top left, uh, right-hand corner, uh, also from OER Africa, just to make sure that it all runs very smoothly. My name is Andrew Moore. I am representing OER Africa today, and um, I have introduced myself uh, four times. Well, this is the fourth time. Uh, if you'd like to know more about me, there's all the social media links that you can download this 
uh, PowerPoint and have a look if you're interested. Um, yes, but my particular uh, uh, interest is obviously in open educational resources, and we're going to be offering you a whole load of them based on today's presentation. And um, obviously, technology is kind of one of my uh, loves. So the marriage of good pedagogy and the technology together is kind of where I, I like to sit. All right, so today's one is on communicating effectively during campus closure, and it really is the fourth piece of our puzzle. We've already had a look at a very general introduction to ERT in webinar one. Uh, if you are um, uh, new on this occasion, then we would strongly recommend you go back and have a look at the recordings of the webinars for one, two, and three. The second one was on what to teach, how to sift through your curriculum carefully to find things that lend themselves to ERT. And last, well, Monday's one was on uh, various activities and assessment and diagnostic tools to kind of work out if learning is actually happening. Um, so that was number three. So this is the fourth piece, and we're going to talk today about how do you keep them, uh, how do you keep your students engaged, interested, interacting, um, using communication tools. So that will be the focus today. Um, just uh, for those who are new, ERT, we're going to use that term a lot, um, emergency remote teaching. And we differentiate it from online learning, for example, because in this particular instance, we're looking at quick ways that we can get people who have previously no experience or very little experience with online learning up and running and engaging with their students and making sure that learning continues uh, during this time of crisis. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna use ERT uh, in that sense. All right, so what is our agenda for today? So um, I've divided up into four. The uh, one of them is on uh, how do you devise a communication strategy? So if you really want to be organized, you should think through um, how am I going to engage uh, in terms of communication uh, to who, with what, and what am I going to talk about and so on. So I'm going to talk very briefly about developing a little strategy for your communication. Then we're going to have a look at effective communication practice so that when you are engaging in terms of writing messages or engaging with people in various platforms, what is good practice? We're going to very briefly look at some digital communication tools. I think you guys are getting up to speed quite quickly uh, with these things, but I'll identify the usual suspects and the ones where there's lots of support. And then right at the end, we are going to encourage you to start thinking about how do you facilitate synchronous meetings like a Zoom meeting or like um, a Skype meeting and so on. So wh what role should you take and how should you mediate these type of synchronous meetings? So we're gonna have also look at that as well. So that's our agenda for today. Time permitting, we'll have a very quick look at how to get some uh, technology up and running to support your communication strategy. Um, obvious things that we could do that will have a big impact is create a WhatsApp group for your class or for your course, um, and also to create a Facebook page for your course so that you can use these uh, tools to uh, distribute information and, and communicate. If you are interested in this presentation uh, and or the recordings, both this webinar four or the previous ones, one, two, three, and four, they are available in our Google Classroom. So you can go and have a look at our classroom. We did talk about Google Classroom in webinar two, and we're trying to emulate um, uh, how to use Google Classroom. There's the code. Uh, you would simply go to that URL and then plug in that code. Some people have been saying that they couldn't get in. And we have subsequently found out that Google likes some domains and it does not trust some domains. So there is actually a filter on who it lets in. 
what we have discovered is that if you use your Gmail account, then you can just walk straight in. And there are places still in the classroom. So if you'd like to go in there and when we have a discussion during the course of today, um, you can actually use the discussion forums in the classroom if you want. Um, otherwise, you use the Zoom chat. However, if you can't get into the classroom, do not panic. All the materials are available on the OER Africa website. And uh, there's the link there. We will upload uh, today's resources as we get them after the webinar. Webinars one, two, and three are already in place and you can go in and get them. All right, so that's the admin for today. Um, so let's begin in earnest. Right. We're talking about communication and effective communication. And if you want to be really organized, and we would encourage that you, that you be so, then you should actually sit down and spend a bit of time thinking and planning about how, uh, what communication strategy would work for your context, for your students, and uh, for your subject. And so there are a couple of questions which you need to ask yourselves. And um, here are just a couple of ideas to, to kind of mix up your strategy. I'm going to talk in a minute uh, in more detail, but you need to plan and strategize. And I've put a little table of guys there because ideally you should really plan and strategize with your department or with your college or your school or your, even your university and uh, try and get um, consensus on how things should work and who is playing what role. Uh, and so on. Um, one of the th things that are very important though is that you come up with very clear contact and availability information. So um, one of the things we're picking up is that during ERT, um, the faculty often feels overwhelmed. Students are panicky. They're not used to this type of teaching and learning and they bombard faculty with a whole host of needs and requirements and concerns and woes and so on. And they can be a bit overwhelming for uh, faculty as well. So you might be experiencing um, uh, the expectation by the students that you should be on call 24 seven. So we would argue then that your communication strategy, one of the things it should identify is very clearly who should be contacted for what and when that contact uh, will be responded to. So not just the time, but also um, what's the time delay within how quickly will they respond to various requests. So with encouraging you guys in your plan to think very clearly about contact and availability information. And then because of ERT, there are so many tools and we'll have a look at them in a minute, but um, it'd be good to have a mix of different types of opportunities. And we'll explain why l later on, but we've already in previous webinars mentioned that synchronous meetings, that is live or immediate meetings, um, uh, of, are, are very engaging. People find that, uh, students find that they can see you, that they, they know what's going on, they feel on, you're on top of things, they feel on top of things. So synchronous is very very nice, but it takes a bit of setting up. Um, for example, even this webinar, there was quite a lot of setting up for it, for it to happen. Asynchronous, meaning not live, meaning can be done uh, uh, within certain parameters at any time. So asynchronous opportunities should also be in your plan. So what's synchronous and what's asynchronous and which tools are you using and so on, all right? And then my fourth item, I thought, uh, try and not be too predictable. <laughs> uh, if you find that you keep sending out the same type of message every week, then people start to ignore it. It becomes mundane and, oh uh, yeah, it's one of those and uh, so on. So ideally your plan should have a whole load of ideas about how you can be creative, um, how you can shake them up a little bit, perhaps be provocative um, and come up with some creative announcements to keep people interested and engaged. Don't become too predictable in your communication strategy. All right, so if you are building a strategy document, then what should be in it? 
And um, I was going to, I found this this morning. I actually thought, oh, this is quite cool. It's not an OER. You, you know, uh, in the previous webinars, I've been trying to give you a whole host of uh, free openly licensed materials. And there's a whole load in here as well. But this one is fully copyrighted, but it is a, um, a free to use for individuals and to share. So I thought, oh, well, we'll stick this in because it is actually quite good. So here's like the structure of what your plan might have. So first of all is um, according to um, uh, our author comms 2.0, um, the he would say, first of all, you need to say, understand what is it that you're trying to do? So what is your context? What is your specific aim of the strategy and what you want to achieve? What are your objectives? So he said, get that out the way first. Make sure it's very clear about what the purpose of this document is supposed to do. Then he would say, all right, now have a think. How are you going to do it? So what is your strategy? So what's the scope? Uh, what do you... Um, uh, and then who exactly is involved and who is also the audience. And then another section would be on where and when, and there's some ideas in there, what's your channels, what's your timeline, what type of message content are you, this thing's in the way I'm, I'm get rid of this. Um, what's your message content and so on. And, uh, Yes, okay. And then uh, towards the end, what are the resources that you're going to use? So the more detailed it is, the easier it is to run your communication strategy, but it does require um, a bit of thought and uh, a process. And then ideally, of course, we should evaluate to what extent it achieved its objectives after it's been running for a while and maybe revise it in light of what we're discovering. All right, so have a look at that. There's a link there and you can download that if you feel this would be useful in devising such a document. We said um, in previous webinars, we've mentioned that there should be, rather than feeling that you should be on call 24 seven, um, rather set some office hours. And um, obviously people can ask questions and send emails and uh, log queries and so on 24 seven, but the faculty only commits to responding at certain times. Um, and that just gives you some space in order to, to Get rid of these things. That gives you some space to um, uh, be able to work effectively. So I've just called up an example here so you can see um, how other uh, organizations have done this. This is from Matthew Ganiwe School of Leadership and Governance. They're here in Gauteng in South Africa. They run a little online courses and these are examples of their communication strategy for their courses so you can see they're very clear about which components of work will be done when so you can see that each of those cells is a different unit of study and then we can see when during the time that has been allocated for example it says 21 to 27 august then it says well during that week who is the facilitator on duty between five and six o'clock in the evening? They made the decision that uh, their office hours would be nightly, every night. Um, and it would run from five to, to seven for two hours in the evening, but they would have two different facilitators on call. And you can see they provided their, the, uh, the email addresses of the facilitators. The, uh, st the students were actually teachers in this instance, also had access to telephone, so they could, they would, those phone calls would be taken during those times if they got the right person. All right. So there's an example of them thinking through the the when in terms of communication and support. This is another African course, which um, where they built their communication strategy around their course. Here, this is more the who. Uh, in the strategy. So um, this one is from a Kenyan ICT CFT, uh, Competency Framework for Teachers. It's a ICT integration course for teachers. And they uh, had an orientation right up front and then they shared, who do you talk to? So they wanted to make very clear who handles what type of issues. So if there were any academic assistance required, then those three people at the top there were the, um, 
the people you could go to, emails uh, supplied. If they needed technical assistance, it was a blended learning course. So there was Moodle and devices and things involved. Uh, people were forgetting their passwords, etc. So then there was a link to a person who provided technical assistance. And then they had little um, specialist groups, uh, tutors for want of a better word, but these were online tutors. And they would obviously um, uh, be more down at the level of the actual content in the units of study that was going on. So they made it very clear in their communication strategy as to the who should be approached. All right, so how would you make your own little communication strategy? I've given you a chart or a poster which can help you guide you in terms of structure, but here's some um, interesting little OERs. Um, the first one is very nice. It kind of breaks it down into steps about how to create your own um, communication plan that would incorporate social media. Uh, it's by a blogger called Sue Beckingham. She does lovely stuff. So have a look at that one. And then the second one is a, is a bit weird. Uh, it is a little YouTube video. Um, it's really about church communication. Um, how does a church communicate with its, its congregation? But the principles are perfect for us. So instead of saying church, you can say class. Um, and they come up with four um, good little uh, uh, steps about how to do your, your planning. So I thought that transfers across very nicely. Uh, it is a uh, openly licensed YouTube video. And then there's a, a book on effectively uh, on humanizing online teaching and learning. And there's a special chapter just on the whole communication and devising a strategy. So um, it's a little bit long winded, but good stuff, but nice stuff. All right. Sure. That was a, a run by me. So I think it's, let's now get to hear you guys. Um, and uh, for those of you who are experienced in this field, we would like to know um, what communication strategy advice you've got. And for those people who are new to this field, we would like to know um, what are your faculty's experiences of this first part of the national lockdowns and the campus closures? And do you feel that you are being um, uh, overwhelmed? Uh, do you feel there needs to be some effective methods put in place to protect faculty from this barrage of requests? So let's, can you um, use the chat facility? Uh, let us either know your, your, let us know your experiences um, there is also the classroom. There's a place, there's a discussion forum in the classroom. So if you have access to the classroom, can you please do that? And if you're really struggling, um, there's an yeah, email link which you can use as well. We had it up at the beginning uh, for Neil. So um, can you use one of those mechanisms to get your views across? Okay, Andrew, so I've got a couple of raised hands. Are you ready to take a couple of inputs? Sure. Um, okay, so first I have Alice. I have your hand. Um, but unfortunately, you don't seem to have audio, so I'm not sure how to connect you. Um, so next is uh, Jay Fatakun. So I'm going to unmute you to talk. You are unmuted if you'd like Thank to talk. You. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful experience. Uh, the lockdowns actually giving us uh, a challenge, and that has helped us to bring out at the best in us to start online teaching with our students in Anko University, Lagos. However, there are some uh, issues, uh, general issues anyway, so students couldn't get along very well because of uh, maybe network connection. And uh, the major issue really now is using the Google Classroom. I am thinking, how can we um, domesticate the CAHO to assess our students? Is there any help you can give in this direction? Uh, when we did the demonstration, 
I registered as a, a student to be able to participate in the, uh, in the questions. Now, how do I come in to send my questions and register as a, uh, as a faculty member? It's one of the issues I want to, you know, to address for us here in Angkor University. Um, Secondly, the Google Classroom, yes, if you go to meet, the video aspect of it, there is attendance there. But the attendance there is a continuous one. Uh, I'm still thinking, anytime you do a presentation, you start the attendance all over again. Maybe you want to move from presentation mode to the uh, chalkboard, that's the whiteboard mode, the attendance will start all over again. Is there any help in generating the attendance list? exclusively so that everybody can be covered within the period of either one hour lecture or two hours lecture thank you sure okay um i hope i heard that correctly um the first part on assessment um we, we Andrew, did yes it's just been a request if you could uh, because also other people struggled a bit to hear if you could just um repeat the question as you understood it I don't think there's a point in, in uh, unmuting again because the, the line wasn't great, but if you can just repeat the question as you're understanding it and then uh, give your reply. All right. Um, the first question was about um, assessment and how can we um, still have rigor and um, be able to track students' progress and so on um, and what tools are available. So um, uh, we did cover this in... Webinar three. So I would say, um, if you want it, it's the answer in detail. I would ha have a look at that recording. Um, but the quick answer is that if you want to be rigorous in terms of tracking student progress and uh, making sure that they are um, developing, then ideally you should get your assessment within a closed environment like a learner management system where we know who those students are they've they have to log in they have usernames and therefore the, the and then after that the platform will track what they do and what they say and you can even grade them and so on you can uh, then use also develop term marks so i'd say if you if you want your assessment to be rigorous then you're going to have to put them into a platform whereby it can track what they're doing so these fun things like cahoots and quizzes that we did last time are really only any good for formative assessment where it's kind of a learning aid rather than a, um, a reviewing of proficiency uh, tool. And then your second question was, ah, I've forgotten. Okay, it was, I'm, going, I'm going to move on to Renel. Right. Um, in the meantime, and then hopefully you'll remember it. Otherwise, maybe, uh, Jay Fratikun, you can just type it back in the chat. Um, Andrew, one other question that someone is asking, which I think is relevant at this point, is uh, just how to manage in terms of being overwhelmed. Uh, it says we're working more than 15 hours a day. And I wonder if you might be able also to address that once Renal has spoken, because I think a lot of the problem there comes with the channels of communication getting too open and students having too much access to, to, to academics and educators in this context. But before we go on to hearing from you about that, maybe that's something you can address. I'm mm -hmm. opening up for you, Renel. You should be unmuted now. Thank you, Neil. Morning, everyone. Renel Evans, University of Pretoria, South Africa. Um, I just would like to respond to the topic of the day, the communication and how we deal with that. Um, I agree with being overwhelmed. Um, students are needing some form of contact. And I think just typing a little question quickly to hear that the lecturers out there might also be the case. Um, I'm responsible for a module that has 987 students. That means just under a thousand. And we are three lecturers who deal with them. What we have done is um, we've taken the many emails and WhatsApp messages and we've created an FAQ sheet, frequently asked sheet, where um, there's a question with an answer and another question and an answer. And that seems to have alleviated the many emails and um, barrage of WhatsApp or SMSs coming through. And um, we've also created at the moment four times a week, which I personally think might be 
um, too many sessions. We, we might be grading down to two sessions, but we've created virtual consultation hours where we, we've we indicated what time we're available and we are live online, all three of us, and um, we are then trying to respond to questions. That session is being recorded. The platform that the university uses is Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Cool. Uh, very nice. And we mentioned frequently asked questions last time, um, back in webinar two. Um, and here you can hear an example of where it's actually helping to, to um, uh, limit repeat requests for information. So the idea then of a frequently asked question page or a document uh, is that those questions that keep coming up, um, the, you'd say to a student, have you checked the FAQ? If, you, if it's not in there, then uh, uh, can you express the concern again? And that way you don't have to keep repeating yourself over and over and over again. Um, if one person's got that issue, probably a number have as well. It's very rare that it would uh, just be a one-off type thing. So the idea then is that's a good one. And I do like the virtual consultation hours as well. It's when um, the lecturers are available and people can come in and ask. And um, the, that also sounds good. The, uh, you might also remember we mentioned um, another way of doing frequently asked questions is to have like a summary at the end of the week where you say these issues kept coming up in terms of communications and then you can um, publish what those are. Uh, sometimes it's done as a video because then they can see you as well. Um, sometimes it doesn't have to be. It could be a, a digest uh, in the email and so on. So, yes, uh, we've got to find ways then to kind of support these people. They are feeling vulnerable. They, they're in, uh, also been pushed into an environment that they're not totally familiar and comfortable with. So we do need to provide the support, but at the same time, we've got to protect ourselves. We, we mustn't become totally overwhelmed. And therefore, that's why your communication strategy is important. You've got to put in place what are these mechanisms like Pretoria has in terms of these two approaches. So nice. Are there any other questions? Not at this stage, so I think go ahead. All right. There's lots of questions coming through on the chat, but uh, others are also answering. So let's keep moving, and then Tony will sift out a couple of questions for you as we go along. Okay, and there's another example. What Neil has just told me is that you guys are helping each other, and we should be doing something similar. We mentioned in the last webinar or again, was it number two, uh, that we should try and put together peer networks where they can help each other. And we mentioned previously that these peer networks have always existed previously, admittedly face-to-face. -face, and that's where most students get uh, used to get their uh, course um, information. Um, and now suddenly that's disappeared. So try and think of ways that you can put these peer networks back together again. So it could be a WhatsApp group or perhaps a Facebook page or, or something whereby they can help each other as well. Um, that's another way to stop the faculty from being overwhelmed uh, by um, all these requests for support. All right. So assuming that you've got your little communication strategy in place and you know who's doing what and when you're publishing what and so on, then um, it's an idea. Uh, how do you structure these communications? I mean, the actual communique, how do you um, uh, write it uh, or uh, video it or in such a way that it really is effective? So the, uh, here are four little ideas. Number one is these communications need to demonstrate that you're out there. We mentioned in webinar one that there must be a presence. You must have a presence online. You can't just now disappear and uh, put up a front where everything looks like it's controlled by the LMS. You, you need to be there as a person and they need to see you uh, there, even though it's all remote. So be involved, be active. And if there's an opportunity for a discussion like a forum or a WhatsApp group or something where there's a discussion taking place, be in there. I mean, don't answer all the questions, uh, especially if it's an academic question. Don't answer it straight off. 
uh, let the discussion evolve and and try and shape it and try and point people in certain ways. So the idea then is even in these uh, opportunities for online discussions, you need to facilitate the discussion and you need to be in there so that they can see uh, your role. Um, another one would be to, when you are engaging with people, try and be as personal as you can. Now, if you've got 950 people in your group, that's very difficult, okay, to, uh, in fact, it's impossible to be personal to everyone. But um, at least show some interest in the person as an individual rather than as a great big collective, the class. So try and look for people so that you can show that you are personable. Um, and then your feedback should be meaningful. So um, yeah, none of this yes, no, okay type of response. You, you should um, uh, craft your communications so that they are helpful and useful, that they mean something and so on. Um, you should also try and keep interest going. Um, we mentioned also in webinar one that e-learning is a very um, difficult environment for the learner. They often feel alienated and isolated and uh, therefore you need to be engaging and sending out regular little messages about new things that have popped up or a, new, um, a piece of news which is relevant to what you guys are studying and so on. So send regular engaging announcements so that they can see that things are alive and moving along and that they should be moving along too. That they're not just been left alone and nothing's happening. It's all very easy to think everything's died during ERT, nothing's happening, and therefore they can now also um, uh, slack off. You've got to keep the momentum and the interest running uh, and show that they are being tracked and listened to and so on. All right, however, these communications or communiques should be uh, as concise and as clear as possible. So no waffle. Yeah, remember we mentioned earlier that you, uh, in webinar one, or was it two? It's all beginning to blur. Uh, that um, when you're identifying what resources that you should give them, you should find only the core resources that you should be giving them only essential data. And so your communication should be similar in nature, that they should be concise, clear, and as short as possible, actually, uh, without being too trite or uh, too distant. So, um, yeah, so keep your style of writing clear and concise. <coughs> Here's um, CILT again from UCT. <coughs> Pardon me. And I love the little uh, advice that they gave. And I've used this often in my, in my little courses and so on. Um, in this book called Facilitating Online, they said that when you are writing, don't do these things. Okay, so these are don'ts. So, for example, don't write long emails. Keep them concise. Don't give very short answers like yes, no, or rubbish, etc. Okay. Don't give very long answers that go on and on and on, blah, 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 blah. Um, reading online is difficult at the best of times, and therefore you need to uh, keep your ideas uh, as tight and organized as possible. Don't get into waffle. Don't answer mails, and when you do answer, be very, very critical. So uh, if you are going to be critical, and let's face it, um, sometimes you need to be, that's your role, really, to kind of guide and uh, make people develop and grow. But don't be very critical in the sense that they feel deflated or broken. The idea then is um, keep in constant contact and that if you do need to be critical, then be very careful in how you uh, express it so that it doesn't become um, uh, attacking. Don't provide deadlines. For ERT, in fact, you need to be very organized. You've got to tell them when things are ready. We keep mentioning that because these students are now remote, they think that because it's all silent and quiet, nothing's happening. So therefore, they need to have clear deadlines about when things are due 
and what their tasks are and uh, what you are trying to achieve. What are the goals of these various um, activities and so on? So you need to be very clear and you need to um, obviously be flexible for individual needs, but you've got to be able to put them out there. Um, if people have specific roles, then again, they need to be defined so it's very clear. So everyone knows what they're doing, even though they're not together in a big group. So if there's roles that are important, then can you define them clearly? <clears throat> Don't give people very strict, long, or complicated guidelines. So keep it simple. Uh, for online uh, learning and for uh, ERT, we need to um, make everything as easy, accessible as possible. So don't over design stuff. Keep it simple. So if there's any guidelines going out, again, keep it simple. And don't promise to do something, but then don't deliver. All right. So if you've said you would do something, then you must, you must be responsible and get that out there. If you say you will do something, it must happen. Um, uh, again, it's, it's just as easy for us because we're not engaging face to face to think, oh, it's all a bit more lax and a bit more um, easy. Uh, uh, oh, I'll do it later. No, it's probably even more important now that when you promise something, you deliver and it's uh, on time as you suggested in the first place. All right. A little basket uh, Andy, of... Uh, sorry, yes? could you stop a moment? Uh, on that previous slide, um, you were saying don't provide deadlines. Um, I wonder, could you... Uh, one or two people are asking that. They're a little confused by that. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, uh, all right, okay. I meant... I, I think I've, I summarized it wrong. I was trying to make it concise for the slides. Uh, uh, no, it mean, I meant... Um, don't provide deadlines. Which what what we what they mean here in this document is that um, a lecturer uh, keeps everything a bit loose and a bit disorganized. But here they're trying to suggest that you must provide clear deadlines. All right. Oh. So that it's what it's that strange negative grammar, um, which is causing the confusion. But let's just make it very clear. You guys must set deadlines and they must be clear, well communicated, and everyone must know when certain things are in or when a reading must be finished or when a particular um, synchronous meeting will take place uh, and that everyone must be involved. So you've got to be very clear about when things are due and, um, and what the, your expectations of them are. So... You, yeah, yes, please. We want it clear about when these things are due. Well, I, I think there, Andrew, it will be important just to adjust this slide before you share the slides with people. Yes. That's what I think. think. Yeah. Okay, cool. Can do. Um, all right. Uh, let's, that is, this, uh, it, it, it has thrown up issues because it's, it's the negatives. All right, but don't worry. Okay, we will make that very clear because that's the message, isn't it? That's exactly the message. Things need to be very clear. All right. Um, a little basket of open resources. Uh, there's that uh, manual, which I've used many for many years. Um, there's also, we've got another student remote learning resource kit. This is very interesting. This is, um, it's been put together by students for lecturers. This is what, according to Sue Beckingham's blog site, um, these are the types of things that students are looking for in terms of communication and in terms of um, how they want to be engaged with and which platforms and so on. Admittedly, the, it is American, but many of the ideas are, are, are good. Um, and coming from students is always nice to have their perspective on things as well. And then the third one is um, a great article on how to build rapport. Uh, all the ways that we used to build rapport previously in face-to-face -face sessions has gone a bit wibbly-wobbly now. So how do we do that online? How do we create connections between ourselves and our students? So there's a nice little article uh, with some good ideas about how you might do that. Okay, again, they're all OERs. Knock yourself out.
All right. Shall we um, ask uh, for questions? Have anyone, people got any observations about how they can uh, uh, craft their communications? And um, what do, uh, for those people who have not really thought about it before, you can also think um, your normal communications, would you say they are clear and concise or do you tend to feel that you want to be as comprehensive as possible when you're right? A number of people are clarifying um, that previous slide about deadlines and emails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, one of the participants a little earlier, and I don't know if you want to cover this now or um, refer them elsewhere, uh, and Tom Bizardwa, Linda, was asking about how do you evaluate class participation? Online. Yes. All right. Um, one of the ways you can do this, because obviously um, the, it's, it's well known that in the online environment, uh, we, I think it's called the 90% rule, 90% of people just lurk. And um, that means they're watching and they're following, but they're not actively participating. Then about 9% of people um, are partially involved. So they might make a few comments and so on and uh, uh, whatever. And then you've got 1% who are these terriers, these people who love to almost hear their own voice. And so they are, they are constantly um, engaging. So it makes it very difficult if you're just watching a, a discussion or something like that to know whether um, everyone is engaged and following and um, uh, and getting the most out of it. So if you want to measure class participation on a particular activity, then you need to organize it so that they're aware that they, you are tracking them, that they uh, are being watched, and that, that there is a minimum requirement as to what their participation should be. So for example, in a learner management system, if you have a discussion forum going, you can pe let people know that in order for the system to mark that they have completed that activity, they must post twice and they must reply to a post twice is the bare minimum if they want to get the duly performed for that, for that activity. So all the LMSs have some type of uh, tracking system. And I know for, I'm, I work in Moodle. I know Moodle therefore allows you to set the bare minimum of what people must do in order to, to uh, be marked by the machine that they have performed the minimum, the minimum uh, activities. And then um, you can, if you want to, even add marks. So you could say it's not just posting in a discussion forum, for example, but it's the quality of your post, to what extent you have engaged with the, 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 the question or the, um, the, the item. And therefore, you can mark them. And you can say out of how many marks um, you want it for. And if necessary, you can make it part of the term, term mark. Um, so there are... Um, ways to track what people are doing, make sure that they achieve a minimum participation, and then if necessary, even quality assure their responses in terms of giving them marks. But um, yeah, that all needs setting up. And so you need to know that in advance. And as we've already mentioned today, your communication um, with the students must make that very explicit. These are your expectations of what a minimum participation would be. So something like that is a way to do it. Keep in mind again, 90% of people just observe, 9% get partially involved, and then you normally have 1% who are all over the place um, and everywhere. So yeah, you've got to find a way of teasing it out so you can see that the others are also following. Are there any other questions? There are several suggestions actually on the, on the chat, no specific questions right now. Um, just one point is that there are so many good suggestions on the chat that um, people will receive a, a record of the chat after the meeting and they can, they can then go through some of these very helpful suggestions and implement them themselves. Yes, yeah, so we're right. putting the recording and the chat available on the OER Africa website and you can download the chat and have a look. Please. Thank you, because uh, I think some of the, the clarifications would be very useful there, and so people can do that.
I think you can continue, Andrew. Uh, um, Andrew, before you go on, uh, someone has asked you to explain less is more. Um, I've, I've pointed out on the chat that your, your, uh, the one slide that was exceptionally confusing is a good example of bad communication. Uh, yeah. so thank you. You've shown people what happens if you don't communicate very clearly and concisely uh, online. It creates enormous confusion. Uh, so for those of you who weren't clear, what Andrew was saying is that you should give deadlines. In other words, do give deadlines, but don't be overly long. So it's about, the, the point is about getting the, the length of your responses correct so that they're not so short that people don't understand them, which is what the mistake that Andrew made, and not so long that they lose track of what you're saying. Um, so before you go on to explaining also the less is more, a little bit more, I do have one hand. I'm going to unmute uh, Topek Alifa uh, so that you can give uh, a quick input, please. You're unmuted. Hello. Hi. Hello. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? We Just can hear you. Hello. You're a bit faint, but, but okay. please give a quick input. Yes, um, I just wanted to ask. I have a peculiar situation in my university. When we teach um, general courses, we have um, at least 600, 1,000 students that are together. Now, I'm wondering what um, methods we could, you know, strategies we could put in place to teach ER, I mean, to deploy ERT to teaching the students, you know, while they're not on campus. Very large class. Um, uh, I, I think it's kind of what we're trying to uh, cover in the four webinars. Um, uh, maybe I didn't get it all. Uh, you were very faint. Um, uh, in terms of an ERT strategy, if you look at the four webinars together, then I think that it does cover quite a lot of ideas about how it can be done. Um, admittedly, your context will determine what's possible. So we're trying to show you the full gamut of options from environments which are very low tech to those that where it's very, um, uh, very well, it has good access to connectivity and lots of different devices and software and so on. So we we're trying to show you everything because we know you're quite a diverse group. I would say, can you go look through the various uh, webinar recordings and see um, what specific strategy that you are looking for? Okay, I think we should move on, Andrew. Um, All right. Uh, Let's keep going. And if that is your dog in the background, I think you should try and get it out the room quickly. Um, all right. So um, I, this part I'm going to do very quickly because I think uh, this is something everyone else is talking about a lot. And uh, the idea then is what tools are available. And we have mentioned that the, uh, the idea is you've got to choose the right tools for your community. You might remember in webinar two, we talked about um, high immediacy ver uh, versus low immediacy and high bandwidth versus low bandwidth. So you have to find the right, um, uh, the right tool. Um, so the, here are a couple that you can think about. It became quite clear um, that the, LMS is a really good idea. So if your institution has an LMS, it's time to get involved and get stuck in and get to know it well and start learning how it works and so on. And um, so I would say that would be your first stop. If you want to do your own personal one, then the there is an option for there is an option for um, uh, Google Classroom or uh, one of these ones where it's free uh, and you don't need to be part of an institution. You don't need a man in a white coat to look after it. Uh, you can do it yourself. So keep that in mind as well. Let's not throw out the good old phone, especially the mobile now where it's very pervasive throughout Africa and the good old email. Uh, email is free in terms of like a Google account or a Yahoo account. Um, 
and you can easily say that your students as higher education students must have an email and then you can um, kind of build your communication strategy around those type of tools um, the uh, i just have to move this so i can see my own slides okay um the uh Social media platforms, later on in this webinar, we're going to have a quick look at Facebook pages, which you can develop one for your course. Keep in mind, of course, that it's a very, uh, you, although you can create closed pages, um, it tends to be a very public environment. So you want to put all your good stuff on your Facebook page uh, uh, so that people can see beyond just the class who is doing what and what great work you're doing. Um, what we have found very useful in Africa, especially, is the WhatsApp group. One way to keep uh, people connected, and it's very immediate. People are walking around with their phones, and then they get the message almost immediately. So it's not quite synchronous, but it's very close um, in terms of communication. So those work well. Um, Twitter, of course. Some people are big on Twitter. I must confess, I've never really got it. Um, uh, um, but I think that's just me. Um, and a lot of people say uh, the idea of communicating in short little bursts of information uh, is, is very usable and very friendly. Um, but pr probably now what's become the big fashionable thing in the last year, and especially now with all these lockdowns and things, uh, sorry, uh, lock lockdown is these synchronous online meeting platforms. And, um, the things like Teams and Skype and Zoom and GoToMeeting, there's a whole, whole host of them. And many of them come with an initial free plan and then you can, um, if necessary, subscribe for more f functionality if you feel it's necessary or your class is enormous and you need more seats. So yeah, I would say in terms of your tools, these are where you're playing. But um, again, you should think what, what is appropriate for my context? Have a think about your students. <clears throat> we had a, um, a person raise a, a problem in one of the other webinars where 80% of his class were fine. They were connecting through all these various resources, but as much as 20% of his class were uh, not able to. Poor bandwidth in their area and high costs of bandwidth as well across their nation. And 20% is a lot of your class. So, um, yeah, you might find that you need a combination of these tools in order to make sure that everyone is getting your communications. So, yeah, um, some type of an analysis, some needs analysis needs to be done to ascertain what are the optimal tools for your particular context. So keep that in mind. All right. And I think this would be a good t time to now ask you to use the chat again and uh, identify what in your context, in your different countries and your different institutions uh, makes sense for low bandwidth learning environments. I mean, I've just given you a host of stuff. What ones seem to be working well for students who have, who struggle to connect and to access these type of tools? So have a think, and then can you use the chat and give us some ideas what, what, what is working in your context? One of the uh, platforms that is being mentioned a couple of times on the chat is Google Moya Messenger, um, talking about data free uh, in South Africa and Nigeria, but um, people are saying it does have some limitations. And other people are talking, if people reading the chat, because people are making a lot of very useful suggestions. Um, email and WhatsApp are the best for um, low bandwidth. Um, voice notes on not, not, <laughs> voice notes on WhatsApp as well. Mm -hmm. And PowerPoint rather than videos. Okay, again, to uh, videos we know, high bandwidth. Um, only really work well when people have good access to connectivity. Yeah. So people are coming up with WhatsApp, Instagram, Google Classroom, uh, Twitter. People are lamenting that data is never free anywhere, which is 
probably true. Um, somebody's paying somewhere. But emails, WhatsApp, WhatsApp, Telegram, um, those are the ones uh, that are coming through on the chat most of the time. Um, Aika Kulu mentions they only use Zoom for postgraduate students. Um, and then again, uh, finally, email and WhatsApp. So those are the sort of real low bandwidth ones that are being regarded as popular. But I would, I would recommend people to look at the chat because it will continue for a little bit um, after this anyway. Um, all right, so which brings us now to these type of meetings, these synchronous meetings. How should you run your webinar? And it's interesting, now that we've done it with you guys, I would never do it like this again, all right? We've learned so much just from engaging with you on, online um, that I don't think you should emulate what we're doing, um, but let, what should you be doing then? So let's have a look at some of these tips. All right, some things we did do, which we, we were quite happy with, and then we'll see later on there are some things we're not so cool on. Um, first of all, if you are going to run a synchronous meeting on Zoom or Skype or Teams or whichever platform, there is a, there is a set of, um, <sighs> there's some advice that, that we can now start uh, um, agreeing on. Team approach to running meetings. I would say that if you want to do something like a presentation, like I've done, it's almost impossible to be able to track what other people are doing in the back channel. So you really do need some type of a team approach to running these type of meetings. Um, uh, uh, some type of a, a, a producer or a manager or someone who can actually control access to the room, who can, um, like Tony's doing today, he's, he's scanning the chat and making sure that uh, some of the important things are raised uh, and so on. So for me to be able to present and watch the chat is almost impossible. So I would say you've got to start put together a little team. Today we've got four people. Um, uh, in various phases, doing stuff behind the scenes to make sure that it runs as smoothly as possible. All right. Um, it, but it also means maybe for your faculty, maybe not one person should present. Um, you should actually share the presenting so that uh, different members of faculty get uh, exposed as well. So are there sections of the curriculum where there's more than one lecturer uh, working? Then maybe work in a team so that you can share the presenting as well. And then because it's synchronous, it is critical that everyone knows exactly when it is going to run and for how long. And you therefore need to communicate very clearly and well in advance what the scheduling is going to be. So uh, you might have remember our webinar one where um, we put up 10 o'clock UTC. We thought we were very clever. Well, I did. <laughs> and um, we suddenly realized that most people were reading it as 10 o'clock uh, in their country and not thinking that there are actually four and maybe five time zones in Africa. Um, so therefore, it all needs to be very clearly um, uh, uh, communicated about when these things are going to happen. And then the next thing is, if you do have a presentation that you want to work through, but also just for the whole meeting in general, it needs to be quite clearly structured. So you've got to know what it is you want to achieve. If you keep it loose, too loose, that you don't even have any objectives about what it is that this meeting is supposed to achieve, then it becomes kind of mundane and a bit waffly and it doesn't really have any shape and it doesn't really go anywhere. People tend to get sidetracked on issues that perhaps aren't critical to what is going on. For some people now, this has become the social medium this is how they now engage with people. So therefore, a lot of it is chit chat and socializing, which is cool, but not if you have a specific um, intention about what it is the webinar is supposed to, or the synchronous meeting is supposed to achieve. So I would say it does need to be structured. You've got to know what it is you're trying to achieve. But when you read around and you actually see what other people are suggesting in terms of the structure, they say that it shouldn't be over-designed. And if anything, mine might be, but over-designed. Um, you might notice I've got a thing for fours. 
There's four webinars. Each webinar has four um, uh, focus points. And then there was even going to be four OERs for every focus point, but I just could I just ran out of time. So there's only three. Um, it's kind of over-designed and therefore it should be slightly looser to allow a lot more engagement with the community. I feel that we got better as the webinar series went on, but not, we, uh, I think the real value is in the chat rather than me. I think that what people are suggesting is, is exciting and interesting and contextually uh, very real. Um, and so therefore I think, um, yeah, be a little bit careful with your design, keep it a little loose. Uh, not too loose, but some loose, so we can, uh, you can have those type of rich interactions. And then ideally, these synchronous meetings work best when it is a two-way communication. At the moment, it's predominantly one way. I dominate, say, 80% more of the webinar, and we are only getting to hear about the chat every now and then. So I would say you try and encourage a more two-way uh, backwards and forwards. Um, I've really enjoyed this book and I've been giving access to a whole lot of OERs and this is the only non-OER, but I really think it's good stuff in here. So I've put it up here. It's fully copyrighted. It's a proper textbook um, uh, and so on. Um, if you really want it, you can go and investigate. There's the name down the bottom. So this one's not an OER, but it's got some nice stuff in it. So let's just um, see what they say about these synchronous meetings. Interestingly, they say, if, you, if your objectives can be achieved asynchronously, don't do synchronous. Okay, so uh, th these authors are saying that um, really the vast majority of your design for your ERT should be asynchronous, but then um, there are certain things that are so much better if they are synchronous. So keep those separate and don't try and mix them. Do what's best for each of the different types of, of engagement. He would say there should be some type of a checking activity. Now, in these webinars, we've ranged from uh, between th three and 400 people. So um, the check-in activities were almost impossible for that amount. And we've heard from a lecturer at the University of Pretoria that her class is 900 and so on. So a, a check-in activity wouldn't have to be carefully designed so that participants can share their prior experiences and knowledge and feel part of the process. So your size will determine the effectiveness of your check-in activity, but you should still try and uh, allow people to feel part of the process. Um, these authors also encourage a check out activity as well. Um, you, should be, uh, you should be structured but not overly designed. We have, we've talked about that. Um, they say your video cam should be on if possible. They say, um, especially if it's a smaller group, say you're talking about say 10 to 20 people, then you should have your cam on. And the reason why is then you can actually watch what people, you can see if they are bored or they are yawning or uh, whatever, and then you can get some uh, non-verbal feedback on how they are engaging. And also people tend to be better behaved if they know the cam's on. Um, uh, they don't get uh, have s seven different devices open and are working on other things and only partially listening to the webinar, which I think a lot of you are doing anyway. Um, so that's another argument for making sure that you can see the people. Um, they say we should chunk the programs into five minute segments. So they would argue that our segments are way too long before we cut to a, um, a discussion or a chat session or something like that. So they say attention spans for online are much shorter than during face to face uh, engagements. So therefore we should try and change the pace every five minutes uh, and yeah, so smaller chunks. Um, break the session into interactive engagements. Uh, so those, once we have had a, a yada, 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 chat, chat, chat from me, we should then find a way to make it more interactive. Um, uh, and then finally, they, they warn you, note that the retention is about 50% less than face-to-face -face engagements. So they're saying that this medium is difficult and that at the moment, everything I've covered so far, only 50% of it has actually sunk in 
uh, in you guys in the background there. So we, maybe we're trying to cover too much. So the idea then is rather uh, choose what is essential, what is important, and then focus specifically on that, probably spend more time. So maybe the pacing of this webinar is also a little too quick, too long, and maybe too quick. So keep that in mind when you're designing yours. Okay, so they would say, um, try and create some type of interactivity. Your, in, your environment, your online environment should actually try and it should be engaging. There should be interesting things in there. So I try to make the PowerPoint um, as engaging as possible with pictures and short amounts of text and graphics and so on. Um, and so that seems to be on the right track. So they're trying to say, uh, use images, use things to make the environment uh, more interesting. Uh, when I, I met these authors at a e-learning Africa conference and they ran a little workshop and they had us doing all these silly things uh, on the screen. We were drawing on his slides as uh, he was going through them. So uh, silly, uh, things like that to make it interactive, to make it engaging and to kind of encourage, that's his next point, a social aspect to the whole thing. All right, I think we're a little bit, we've got it, but it's not very strong in our design. Provide structure and clarity. Uh, this has been coming through in all our webinars. Keep it structured, make it very clear, uh, make it so that people can uh, see what the main messages are without too much waffle and so on. I think we're quite good at that. Apply a virtual etiquette. So when you do these synchronous meetings, make sure the rules are clear. So uh, whatever you want them to be, make sure that they have been um, articulated clearly somewhere. And I think we did all right at that. Um, keep it short. Uh, include energy breaks if necessary. They do, they do say 90 minutes is the, the absolute maximum without stopping for an energy break. So we're just on the cusp in terms of that. And then use virtual breakout groups. Now, our Zoom didn't allow us to do this, but some of these synchronous meeting platforms do allow you to say, all right, get into smaller groups of a 10 and uh, for five minutes, discuss this issue. So therefore, rather than just post in a, in a chat, you would have um, a much more richer engagement with a smaller group of people where you can hear what they're saying, they can hear what you're saying, and if necessary, you can come up with some type of a simulation between the ideas. Uh, use images over words and provide opportunities for practice. <clears throat> so um, uh, what I try to do is pr give you some tips and tricks to actually practice some of the tools to achieve what we're doing. They would say probably more of that uh, rather than what we've done. Okay. Um, uh, I've been hard on us because I want ours to be even better. So next time around, um, we, we, we will raise, raise the game. But now you can come in and learn from, from what, what we have done. And again, here's a little basket of goodies. Um, one is on how to um, synch uh, synchronous learning. How do you facilitate these sessions? Another one is very nice. It's a, it's a free online self-study course. Um, very, it's, I think it's in Moodle. It's very nicely organized. And you can just go in as guests and actually do the little course. Very nice. Uh, FLOW stands for um, facilita uh, Facilitating Learning Online is what FLOW stands for. Uh, and the last one is one of these open access journals. Go ahead, knock yourself out. This was how uh, a, a research paper on uh, teaching mathematics using uh, one of these synchronous um, setups. So how, how, what was the experience? Cool. All right. So that's basically the main content. But let's, because I've, I've talked up the chat, here's a final um, question. To what extent, oh, I think I've answered my own question. To what extent did the designers of this webinar series implement the, the synchronous commandments, synchronous meeting commandments? And all right, so we can open it up then and we'll change it slightly. What did you like about the webinar in terms of how it responds to those commandments? And what do you think 
were its weaknesses. So let's give you a little opportunity to use the chat or the classroom to actually give us some ideas about what would have worked better in terms of this synchronous meeting. If anyone would like to also make any additional comments on issues of communication, share any thoughts, ask any further questions, please feel free to put your hands up. Uh, I will open up chat, uh, channel, uh, talk channels for audio for people with their hands up. We have Noahiri again, um, who also asked a question in the previous webinar. So Noahiri, I'm going to unmute your channel now. So please go ahead and ask your question. Morning. Morning. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, all, and thanks, um, Andrew, for that uh, um, the wonderful presentation. Then, my contribution is that um, the communication has been wonderful, it's been a very good one. Even your response to all emails, and it was a very quick and precise. So, that's what I want to say. It's been a good one. I've learned how to communicate, leaving no communication gap. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, um, Nwahiri, that vote of confidence at least. Uh, as Andrew has pointed out, this was pulled together very much at the, at the last minute. This is a demonstration of emergency remote teaching in action. Um, but one of the things that you will have seen from this and that Andrew and I have grappled with is Definitely what happens, and I think this is coming from, uh, from what you're saying on the chats as well, the, one of the biggest challenges when you're moving to online teaching for people who are, and, and students and teachers who are used to face-to-face -face teaching, is the risk of opening up too many communication channels and becoming overwhelmed with large volumes of communication. We've seen that very extensively through the chats, and I think it is really important that the, almost the quickest thing you try and learn is exactly how you can uh, control the chat, not let it overwhelm you from the various channels. So I'm gonna move on to Felix, uh, who has his hand up. Um, Felix, you are unmuted now. Oh, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, quite um, appreciating your efforts through this series. I will be concentrating on communication tools. Bearing in mind the different tools we have considered today and those that are available for um, learning in during this remote time. My concern is um, not just the tool, the availability of such tools to meet all the needs. Would you suggest um, we narrow down, for instance, Mojo or Google Classroom as it's being used in my university, Anchor University Lagos, and if for sure that alone would not be able to actually help out in all the learning processes, from teaching to assessment to grading and to maybe exams. So what would you suggest? My point is, would you say it is necessary for us to adapt um, a ready-made tool and uh, maybe modify when necessary? Or in the long run, not in this um, one month of ERT, maybe the ERT continues for six months, would you suggest uh, building up, designing an LMS that will be able to incorporate all the necessary things we've considered? Or we just settle down for one and find a way around it? Thank you. Um, the, in terms of, there's a bit of, for ERT, there's a bit of a catch. So the first prize is to have all the students in one place where, so you can coordinate very effectively your learning program and your communication strategy and if necessary, your assessment and so on. So um, ideally then you would want them in a learner management system because it has already got a whole host of communication tools, content delivery tools, um, uh, online activity tools, it's got a grading system and so on. So really you would want uh, to try and use the institutional LMS for uh, for that. However, the problem is a lot of students are complaining that they don't have access to sufficient connectivity and yeah. devices in order to even engage with the institutional LMS. So um, I would say then for now, you have to kind of, uh, if 80% of your class can get into the LMS, cool, 
but then you still got to think of something to do for those 20. How can you now get the notes out or get the um, activities out in a very low tech um, uh, environment? You're right though in saying that this is an emergency. And so you've got to think on your feet and come up with um, perhaps multiple strategies to be able to cover your students. But in time, the trick will be to say, all right, the bare minimum to do my class would be to have a device and to have sufficient connectivity to be able to access the LMS, for example. So I would say for now, that's part of the stress and the, the, the problem is you've got to maybe think of a couple of different ways to deliver ERT. But six months down the line, I think we, we could have then mandated that there's kind of like a minimum requirement for my class and the minimum will be based on obviously a needs analysis of your class so you can understand uh, where those students are in terms of their real needs and so on. Um, and that's kind of why we've been saying ERT is different from online learning. Normally for online learning, you would have um, advertised that uh, the, the, the minimum requirements to be able to do the course are X, Y, and Z, of which some of it would be connectivity and some of it would be access to a specific device. So, um, yeah, the answer is, one, I'm afraid you're gonna to have to kind of be creative and think about different ways to deliver ERT in the short term, but then start planning about what would it look like six months down the line once people have had a chance to get on their feet and to be able to equip themselves with the resources they need to do their studies. Yeah, I'm afraid it's not clean. It's a very messy answer. Thank you, Andrew. Um, just uh, maybe also a couple of quick observations from my side as the one who, uh, coerced Andrew into throwing this all together at the last minute. Um, I think there would be a couple of very brief observations I would make from having uh, engaged with um, looking at how different countries are dealing with emergency remote teaching that are maybe worth adding. Um, I think the first thing is that people, who, particularly educators and, and academics who are used to face-to-face -face teaching, the, the biggest mistake that people are making is that they are tending to overload their students in the emergency remote teaching online courses. That they are thinking that they need to keep their students very busy. Um, and it's, for example, I have two children and at the school level, the teachers don't seem to be interacting with each other. And my sons are complaining that in the first week of work online, they're getting as much uh, learning activity to do as they would normally get in a month uh, if they were at school. So I think the key message that Andrew's been trying to communicate is to keep things simple and light. The students are already struggling and panicking. The more you overload them, the more you add to their stress levels, and the more you create stress for yourself because you generate a lot of additional work that you need to do. And so I think if you look at all the tools that Andrew has proposed using, the idea is to use the ones that are simplest and that the most students are most likely to have access to. Unfortunately, for universities particularly that are not used to online learning, that often means that they don't have those tools accessible. So you need to work around with some of the other social media platforms available. Um, and again there, all I would stress is to keep things as simple and concise as possible. Um, and, and I think that's really been our key message. As Andrew's indicated clearly, we haven't always got that right ourselves. And I think what you've seen in, in living practice is the challenges of throwing together things at the last minute. Um, but I think what we have also demonstrated, I hope, is that you can actually very rapidly with the available tools, put something together that at least helps people to move forward. Um, I've seen quite a lot of uh, queries and chats from people asking about specific questions. Um, we need to have a follow-up conversation with our colleagues from AAU about where this process goes forward from here. Um, I, I think I saw uh, H. Skuman particularly asking about if, if we could follow up on specific requests. So I am the person who's in contact with all of you via email. Um, what I would suggest uh, is that if you do have some specific additional requests, please send them through to me by email. Uh, if you're asking for individual requests to solve all of the world's problems that you have, uh, I think we'll not be able to help with you. Uh, we, we, we won't be able to help you with everything. But if you can give us some indication of some, some more granular or specific issues where you'd like uh, feedback and input, um, let us look at how we can help with those. In the spirit of what Andrew said uh, earlier, which is 
try and keep everything asynchronous where you can and only make it synchronous when you have to or when there's a specific need for it. What we may do in the next phase is start introducing um, some more asynchronous interaction with you all via email and other channels um, and, and see how we can help you with any further uh, activities. So uh, I think with, with that all in mind, um, I've got one more hand raised uh, from Topek Alifa. I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak very briefly and then we'll ask Andrew after he's responded to just um, wrap up and then hand back to Navumo to close up the session. Topek, you are... Uh, thank you. I just want to seize this opportunity to thank everyone to the facilitators and uh, the participants. I want to say it has been a very huge privilege for me to learn from you people. Actually, I think I don't have an excuse now not to deploy ERT in my teaching processes. And I owe this all to AAU and OER. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Niels. Thank you, the whole team. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Well, Andrew, that seems like the perfect note to, uh, to, to wind up on. I think so, too. Um, you'll see now, just quickly flicked through the little demonstration. Um, the demonstration is available. Oh, I've lost my whole thing. Um, the demonstration is available on the uh, on the actual presentation which we will now put into the um oer africa website and also uh, it will appear well it has it's already in the uh, google classroom um, so keep an eye on that so here's our little summary for um uh, today when you're wanting to communicate effectively there are a number of little things you need to think about Number one is try and have an overt plan. What is the communication strategy for your ERT session? And it doesn't just have to be you. It can be your faculty or your department. Uh, um, how are you going to coordinate communication with the students? And we showed you a whole host of things to think about. Then we said that when you are communicating with your uh, student, what is effective practice? And despite the one slide which, which uh, uh, a lot of people found uh, uh, counted intuitive and the idea is uh, you need to be amenable you need to be approachable you need to be there they need to feel that you're there you need to be concise you need to be friendly um, the idea then is everything must be clear and all expectations need to be communicated properly uh, then we said in terms of your tools available there is a plethora of stuff and you there your choice should be shaped by what is the situation for the students um, do they have access to good connectivity to a reasonable device uh, and if they do then there are a whole load of tools available and if they don't then you have to kind of think of very simple technologies to be able to keep those communications going um, and then finally, we said, should you decide that you want to go for one of these synchronous meetings, like a webinar or a presentation online, then it itself is its own beast. And you need to think very carefully about how to structure it and um, how to make it engaging and to how to make sure that you can uh, uh, keep contact with your students while it's in place. And there we go. So that's our little webinar on communicating effectively during campus closure. And yeah, um, once again, resources are in the Google Classroom and on OER Africa website. I think we can hand over. Thank you very much, Neil, for being an excellent facilitator. Uh, uh, thank you, Andrew, for leading us through these four webinars. And thank you, Tony. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you, everybody that has been a part of this webinar. Certainly, we will be in touch with you concerning what are the next steps. And please also feel free to give us some suggestions. And we will be looking at the chat very carefully 
so that we understand what you would like us to do uh, in, in terms of supporting you. I wish all of you a wonderful day and uh, please keep on teaching, keep on learning and keep engaging your students. Thank you. Thank you, Naduma, and thank you, everyone. Um, we're glad to see from the chat responses that people seem to have found thing, the, the chats useful, I mean, the webinars useful. And mm -hmm. uh, through AAU, we'll be communicating with you what the next steps are once Naduma and I have had a chance to debrief. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Good luck. Thank you. Bye.